what we saw in March was so unprecedented. And when you do see these large scale risk off movements, there's almost nowhere to hide except safe haven government treasuries. Welcome to the Podfolio, Willis Towers Watson's investment podcast series, where we'll give you an update on the latest developments across global markets and talk to expert guests on hot topics that matter to institutional investors and their portfolios. Hi, and welcome back the Portfolio Podcast. I'm your host, Lokmar, and this is our ninth episode already. And we're now starting to get into some of the more specific parts of uh, investment portfolios. And today I'm joined by Namisha Srivastava, who is our Global Head of Credit Research. So welcome to the show, Namisha. Thanks for having me, Lok. And so Namisha and I are going to talk about different types of lending, how things have gone during the COVID-19 crisis so far, and also looking ahead uh, to the future. Now, for me, I've found it takes a little bit of thinking, perhaps to get my head around the full variety of investments that fall under this wide banner of credit uh, in terms of who you're lending to, the structure of the lending, uh, and also the level of return versus the level of security. So we'll be trying to avoid getting into jargon as much as possible and just talk about these investments in terms of what they're fundamentally doing. Uh, So Namisha, uh, first of all, I think most of us are fairly familiar with what's happened to the equity market. So something like a a 30% fall over a very short period of time before rebounding almost just as quickly. Uh, Can you just tell us a little bit about what's happened to the credit market since the COVID crisis started and also how different the experience has been for different types of lending? Sure. And and I might use high yield as just a very representative um, index. Uh, We saw it drop somewhere in the range of 15%, um, but the rebound has only been about 12%. So high yield is is still sort of 3% off where they started the year. So a bit of room to go. But the comment I would make is if you look at certain subsectors within and especially in sectors such as securitized credit, they fell even further, uh, you know, beyond 20%, 30%, in some cases, 40%, depending on where you were invested. Um, so a lot more recovery potential in, in some of those areas. Uh-huh. Um, so let, let's talk, first of all, about the, that initial downfall, which, which, you know, for higher you said was off the order of 15%. What were the sorts of things that were driving that fall? So initially, uh, they held up quite well in the first half of March when you you saw equity markets start to sell off, Um, but then they quickly caught up as investor fear grew as COVID-19 spread. And then you also saw a large oil price shock, which is quite meaningful to a portion of the corporate credit universe across both investment grade and high yield. Uh, So this, it sort of created a negative feedback loop where you saw investor risk aversion rise, more selling, more forced selling, um, causing prices to drop even further. You know, leveraged players had to deleverage, exacerbating some of those price drops. So really vicious feedback loop, I would say, in the last, you know, 10 days of March. Yeah. And then and then obviously things kind of picked up. From there, not not back to previous levels quite, but there was a pretty impressive mm-hmm. uh, recovery as well. So, what what sorts of things were driving that? So the the key the key word that just comes to my mind is the Fed. So government action was a massive uh, part of of the reason why in April you saw some rebound. You saw record rate cuts and the pace of rate cuts. You saw bond purchase programs announced. You saw TALF 2.0 announced to support consumers and small businesses. And you also saw direct household support to consumers with unemployment, with, you know, um, paycheck protection programs. Uh, So just a record pace of issuance uh, of support to to uh, to create some sort of um, bottom, if you will, for for price movements. Yeah. And and, and I I guess I mean, what's on my mind is about how much of this is is artificial in a way and how much reflects the fundamentals Mm -hmm. so so let's have a think about you know where things are right now um and obviously i i want to maybe park investment grade credit to one side so investment grade credit is you know lending to companies with 
you know, stronger credit ratings and, and those things took a bit of a hit and mostly recovered. Uh, so let's just park that to one side and talk about some of the riskier stuff. So kind of the higher, higher yield, but higher risk um, types of lending. What's your kind of overall outlook standing where we are now? Yeah, so the way I, I think about the higher yielding segments, so high yield, uh, for example, is it's, it's really very much an alpha opportunity today. Um, there's still some room to go from a spread perspective, as we touched on earlier. You know, uh, valuations look somewhat attractive, um, especially if you look at certain quality types or sectors. Uh, but there's a lot of dispersion, uh, both across sectors and within. Um, and that just means managers who are capable of selecting the best credits and avoiding uh, the weakest ones have room to capture a lot of value. Uh, you do have a bit of uh, technical um, support as well with Fed purchasing of you know, certain parts of high yield now, fallen angels. So that's supportive to the asset class as well. Um, but when we look at high yield and the range of possible outcomes that could occur, spreads look pretty attractive to compensate for those. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to tie that back with this overall question of, you know, a, a lot of this stuff has recovered in terms of pricing. Mm -hmm. And what's not clear is for individual areas of credit, how much of that recovery is kind of dependent on things that may or may not last and how much is a real reflection on you know the fundamental credit worthiness of the things and, and I think what you're saying about alpha opportunities is you know fr from the outside these things look all kind of similarly priced but um, you know if you have the right kind of uh, investors you could actually pick the opportunities that you know reflect the fundamentals rather than this kind of general rise back up in the credit markets with that I mean is that a fair thing to say? Yeah and I, I think I think that's fair luck and I think we're we're just about to see Q2 earnings, you know, being reported. We saw the bank's earnings this week. We're, you know, we're seeing more corporate earnings next week. That's when we will actually start to see some of the impacts COVID-19 um, and oil have had on some of these names. So to some extent, I, I think it's fair to say there's, you know, the, the broad support from the government has helped these companies and, you know, securitized instruments um, rebound. The the real question, you know, the sixty four thousand dollar question will be what happens when when government support fades, and we may not start to see the real impacts until um, you know, call it September, when we see more of the stimulus fade, um, and you know, we start to see the the real economic fallout. Yeah. That might not be the most chipper chipper answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I completely agree. I mean, I think the test is still still to come, so to speak. Um, and, you know, sticking with these kind of riskier, higher return, higher risk bonds, I think one of the main arguments for investing in them is that they, they can provide you with, with a, a, a kind of in quotations, equity like return but which is still less correlated with the main equity markets. Um, I got to say, I, I like throughout mm -hmm. this particular crisis, I wouldn't say that statement has held up particularly well uh, because, you know, both markets took a pretty big hit. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and um, I think it's fair. I think what we saw in March was so unprecedented. And when you do see these large scale risk off movements, there's almost nowhere to hide except safe haven government treasuries. So um, having that as part of the toolkit, you know, can be quite valuable or having managers who are pretty active um, can be valuable. But I think that the takeaway that I see is when, when we look at a blend across alternative credit, so having enough exposure across corporate credit, consumer credit, country credit can actually help build more resilient portfolios. And we've seen that performance um, fare much better than you know any one of those individually. Yeah, so it's not just not just credit as something that diversifies away from equities, but also having enough diversification within your overall credit investment as well, uh, which I think you know very makes sense. So, um, do you, you know, given where we are now, do you expect to see maybe higher credit allocations and smaller equity allocations going forwards, or, or the other way around? And um, do do you feel like mm -hmm. the balance? between equities and credit is going to change in future? I think so. And, and when you when you opened this up and talked about the, you know, the equity market drop and subsequent, you know, rebound, um, we've already seen a shift in many portfolios 
um, moving a portion of equities towards return seeking credit for that very reason of, you know, performance may be a bit on par uh, between a diversified basket of alt credit and equities. But as I noted, there's a lot more room to go in credit, especially in some of these sectors that still remain wide. Um, and so there's a good argument from a portfolio standpoint to start to shift some portion of equities towards that um, and build a bit more resiliency to you know, future downsides. Uh, yeah. So we've already started to see that. I think, I think it's fair to say we'll see a bit more going forward. And um, as um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of our discussion, that there's so many, many different types of credit, different types of lending. Obviously, you know, over the space of a podcast, we haven't got time to go through you know, all of them individually to kind of talk about what they mean. But I, I'd like to just get and paint an overall picture of the of, of the credit landscape, if you like. Um, I'm going to try something a little bit different, Namisha. I'm going to try... Um, bit of a quick fire round uh, if that's okay with you so I'm just going to kind of fire at you a few kind of um, choices and comparisons between different types of lending uh, and obviously it goes without saying that you know the correct answer will depend on client circumstances and, and market conditions at the time but I just want to see whether it's possible to get a general feel from you whether you've got a leaning or preference for one thing or the other just to get a lay of the land so um if you're up for it i'm just going to fire some um um different ideas at you um so the yeah, first one is yeah <laughs> so the first one is who do you prefer lending to and i'm going to summarize them as the, the three c's so do you, do you prefer lending to corporates or to consumers or to countries uh, I would pick consumers today. Lots of government support and lots of room to to add value. Yeah. So, I mean, for the same kind of, I mean, we're talking the riskier stuff for the same kind of yield, you're saying kind of lower risk of default or, or downgrade essentially then compared to lending to corporate. Yeah. And where, where are you going? Yeah. And where, where where's that coming from? Is it the kind of level of debt or um, financial difficulties, support? It is. Yep, I agree. And I would say this is the same tilt we had pre-crisis as well of consumers just looking from a fundamental standpoint, better than corporates, less leverage. You know, we, we went through a massive deleveraging post the global financial crisis. Um, actually, you know, pre-COVID, um, you know, savings and unemployment were looking good. Um, Post-COVID, those are questions. However, you have strong government support helping them in the near term. Um, but you also have some of those fundamental buffers with less debt uh, helping them. Okay, um, and then and then um, the second question in my quick fire round is your preference for, I guess, the structure of the lending. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got bonds, which are more kind of publicly available and traded, or loans, which are kind of more private arrangements between the borrower and lender. Do you have a preference at the moment? I like bonds uh, from, a, from many aspects. Uh, first, you've got the fundamentals going for you. Uh, leveraged loans do have more fundamental issues with weaker covenant structures in recent years, um, just less protection. They don't have the same backstop from the government that bonds do, i.e. there's no government program buying loans. Um, and there's a lot more dispersion on the bond side to make the alpha story quite interesting. So my bias would be, would be high yield bonds. OK, um, and, and then the next one, Namisha, um, is securitized versus unsecuritized. So, I mean, by that securitized, I just mean, you know, is the contract is set up in such a way that if the borrower doesn't pay you back, then you can go in and, you know, take over some of the assets to compensate for your loss. Um, have a preference for either, either structure? I would say securitized just for that structural security you mentioned. So obviously in securitized, you can take the very bottom piece of the structure that's not what i would say is is attractive but some of the more mezzanine or higher up in, in seniority sectors look quite compelling from a from a spread standpoint to compensate for you know a wide range of outcomes that could unfold all right um and then the next one uh, on my list is liquid versus illiquid so you know liquid is just instruments you can get into and out of easily whereas illiquid is um, something that you expect it to hold over the longer term um, under these market conditions I guess there's a fair amount of uncertainty um, where where do you sit on that one 
I, I really want to say both, but uh, I know you're going to make me pick. No, I, I think I you're allowed. Say... You're allowed one both, <laughs> Namisha. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, I. It depends. I would say that the illiquidity premia looks pretty interesting right now across a wide range of sectors. So we're looking at more illiquid opportunities today than we ever have. Um, that's not to say, you know, the entire portfolio should be illiquid, but that, but there are some interesting premiums to be captured there. Cool. Um, and then and then the last one for you then. Um, there's quite a lot of talk around whether there are opportunities with bonds that have, I guess, I guess, dropped a bit in value, whether you could pick up some bargains. And I've got kind of two examples. One is Fallen Angels. So these are kind of formerly highly rated investment grade bonds that have just dropped out of um, the investment grade bracket through some uh, some downgrade. Uh, but then at the far end of that spectrum, you've got kind of distressed credit, which is, you know, bonds that are close to default or have already defaulted so you could pick them up at a really good price and trying to get as much back as you can. Um, do you have a preference uh, between those two types of um, strategies picking up bonds that have suffered a little bit? I would say fallen angels today um, and distress to come. So right. we don't yet see a ton of distressed volume today but you want to start setting up uh, some ways to capture the opportunity set when and where it unfolds. But the real opportunity today in my mind is in Fallen Angels to, to capture, as you noted, just securities that have traded significantly wider than where they probably should be. Cool. Um, so, I mean, those, those, those are my, my quick fire questions. I think you've gone through the quick fire round with flying colors, Namisha. So congratulations. <laughs> um, just, uh, just uh, I think we've got time for a final question. And, and it's something that's I guess a theme that's gone through all of our podcasts, uh, the theme of uh, sustainable investment. Um, I, I think, you know, investors are increasingly kind of interested and passionate about sustainable investment, but there's also a growing realization, I think, that from a pure investment standpoint, that these things really do matter, especially to the longer term investors that are hold on to, you know, in this case, credit for, for quite a long time. And uh, do you want to just give us um, a, a picture of how sustainable investment has kind of evolved within the credit space? Yeah, for sure. It, it's, it's a space we're spending a lot of time on and where we've seen a significant amount of movements from managers. Uh, I would say three or four years ago, it, it was more simplistic of you saw fixed income managers applying equity screens, um, not really embedding the philosophy of sustainability. Fast forward to today and where we're seeing the most development is, is actually managers finally training staff, hiring dedicated resources and isolating ESG risks and how those would affect an issuer's probability of default. Um, and even in, in segments such as you know, sovereign debt, we're starting to see managers think more creatively about how they engage with sovereigns, working with multilateral organizations, et cetera. So I think in, in my view, sustainability will be the biggest differentiator and what will drive fixed income manager success over the next five years. Wow. OK, um, I think and I think those those are the kind of things I want to talk about. So I just want to thank you, Namisha, uh, for your time and for kind of laying out the lay of the land with the various areas of credit investment for us. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Locke. A pleasure to, to be here. Uh, and so this is uh, the end of this uh, episode as well. Uh, as I said, I think for future episodes, we're going to look into different specific areas of investment and also different specific areas of uh, kind of portfolios as well. Uh, so please do tune back in. And in the meantime, thank you for listening. You've been listening to a Willis Towers Watson podcast. For more information, visit willistowerswatson.com. Mm-hmm.